Well, um, Julie and Maxi, my two partners, and I, we met, I guess now it's seven years ago, mm -hmm. at Copenhagen Business School. So uh, we started, uh, we studied a uh, bachelor together, and basically Julie and I were both late on the first day, mm -hmm. so we met completely confused in the <laughs> center of Copenhagen Business School, where we were supposed to go, um, running around, and then we came into the class, and everybody looked up, you know, who was late on that first day. And then Maxi looked up, and so we just caught each other's eyes, and we started doing group work together, became really good friends, and then we just knew that we complemented each other really well, mm -hmm. and that we wanted to start a company together someday. Okay. Yeah. So how did you come up with the idea? Of it was Maxi. Uh, she was introduced to a menstrual cup by her sister. And then at CBS, we um, all specialized in sustainable business and social entrepreneurship and did a minor in that. And she had a course where she had to write a business plan. Okay. And so she wrote about you know, uh, using a menstrual cup in a developing country. And at the same time, the three of us were sitting together and discussing, we want to start a company. And we had three different ideas, very mm. different ideas. Yeah. And the menstrual cup idea was actually definitely the best one. We actually said, let's start, but we still need to write our master thesis. So we decided to go to a summer house, sit for a weekend together, research so that we could come up with our different thesis. And then we would, when we thought we would hand in our master thesis, mm -hmm. then we would know much more how to go about it. Yeah. However, uh, things rolled out a bit differently, mm -hmm. meaning that we uh, sent, I don't know, 100, 200 emails to a bunch of different NGOs, everything we could find on Google to ask, is it really a problem menstruation? What do women use? Have you heard about a menstrual cup, so on and so on. And we were flooded with response, positive response. And so we just started working. And so today we haven't finished our master thesis. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, one thing took the other. Yeah. And then one year after, basically, yeah. we are working more than full time. Yeah. Master thesis sometime in the future. So we made our own design mm -hmm. and contacted Coloplast in Denmark, the Danish company that specializes in intimate healthcare products. So they came on board to help us with the production of our product. Okay, that's great. And then we did a market study in June, decided to move to Kenya in September. Been living there ever since, set up a company, da 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 da, finished our product, got partners. So it's been a hectic year, but yeah. a great year. Fantastic year. That. So this is it. This is yeah. a Ruby cup. And it is uh, reusable for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And you use it like this. So you fold it basically, like this. Then you insert it into the vagina instead of a tampon, basically. And it opens up automatically okay. and collects the blood instead of drying it, or, yeah? yeah? And after approximately eight hours, depending on your flow, you wash your hands, especially if you're in Africa. Mm. Take the cup out, empty it, fold it, reinsert it. And that's mm, it. And you okay. sleep with it, you swim with it, and then, you know, when your period is over, you store it in your little ruby bag, mm. somewhere that is private, and then next month you take it out again. Yeah. So you just have to boil it in between your periods for five minutes so it's completely sterilized. Yeah. And we were all users of menstrual cups. So Maxi introduced it to me and to Julie. And we were like, well, this is a fantastic product for us. And we can afford tampons and pads. We prefer this product. So we thought, if we think it's the best product, why isn't it available in places where it's yeah. seriously needed? But it shouldn't cost 55 or $35, mm -hmm. right? So there are many other types of uh, other products like yeah. this in the market. And yeah. Um, with the very yeah, the menstrual cup was invented in 1930. I don't know what okay. it was made of. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it had, I think, a, kind of a revolution 10 years ago. Yeah. But it's still very unknown and still has some kind of hippie eco connotations to it. But not mainstream, you can't find it in the supermarkets, for example. No. So it's very much only by word of mouth. But the prices are between 25 to $55 for a menstrual That's cup. However, we just thought, why should it cost $25? How much can it be to you know, produce this product? Mm. So that's how we started. And then we got, you know, made our own brand, made our own design so that we could take the profit margin down so we could make it affordable and available in developing countries. Yeah. So where, do you, uh, where is your production? Our production is in China yeah. uh, and the quality control and so on is overseen by Coloplas. It's our supplier, but they're managing basically the whole process. So, and then we import to uh, Kenya, because they don't have medical grade silicone in Kenya. If not, we would happily do it locally, but yeah. um, it would be too expensive now to import the material. And um, then we sell it through women to women sales. So a Tupperware model, basically. Yeah. And we basically just ask the women, since we arrived in Kenya, what do you think about the product? How do you think we should sell it? Or, you know, how should it look like? And what is important? And just been taking their advice and guiding us and creating our business model together with the users. Yeah. 
Okay. That has been a really interesting process with many positive surprises, some things we would never have thought about. I mean, menstruation, I think even here, it's not something you discuss no, around the dinner table, right? No. I mean, maybe between women, but yeah. you keep it private. Yeah. And in Kenya, it's definitely the same. And I think it's even, it's much worse because you don't have any education about it in school. So um, the girls don't feel like they can talk to their mothers about it. Yeah. Um, and uh, some girls we spoke to thought they had an illness for two years because they didn't tell anybody. So they were scared every month their period came and thought they were going to die. Wow. Um, and also they don't have any products to use because they can't afford them, right? So they use extremely unhygienic solutions like mud and bark and newspaper yeah. and rags. Um, but our experience is that when you first gather a group of women or girls together and you sit down with them and we make always like, I don't know, icebreaker introductions yeah. and get to know each other and you know we all start laughing and gain some trust and we start talking about it they really open up because they really want to talk about it and sometimes they also tell you other things because you create this intimate sphere that is not related to menstruation but it could be related to sexual assaults or something else yeah. because yeah you create this intimate sphere where it's pro you know allowed to talk about mm -hmm. topics that you normally don't do yeah. And I also know that you've won many prizes for your business, including the Venture Cup. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yes. Um, Venture Cup was a fantastic experience. Um, it took place in Denmark, in Copenhagen, at the City Hall. And first of all, we won the, we did five different categories. And we won our first category, People and Society. And afterwards, we had to go and pitch all the different winners of the categories. And um, so the city hall was filled with, you know, 350 guests uh, and jury members. And Venture Cup is traditionally for, it's for all kinds of businesses, so nothing to do with social enterprises. Mm -hmm. So most of the jury members and the people who were there were in, in, in like communications or med tech or very uh, technical solutions, basically. And we were the only ones with like a, a softer, <laughs> <laughs> a softer business. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think, uh, the fact that we won Venture Cup were also shows that in the traditional business scene there is an opening for recognizing social enterprises, social innovation yeah. and social business as not an NGO, nice, neat, marketing, CSR no. thing, yeah. but actually recognizing it as a, as a really competitive business case. So we were extremely proud yeah. that with a social business idea that you could actually win you know, in a hardcore business competition. So I think it shows that we are, society is really moving ahead. Yeah. That there's growth in, in the recognition yeah. of the field. Yeah. We're going to, we're working with different types of partners. So we're doing direct sales in the slum areas where we train the women, but we're also introducing Ruby Cup to, through different other social enterprises that are already working with female vendors and That's selling solar idea. lamps or yeah. selling cooking stoves where they will then uh, add Ruby Cup as a part of their basket of goods um, and check out how, you know, what is the best scaling model actually and how can we do a franchise package that can reach out since we are not present in Latin America, it's a simple product. We yeah. just need the right kind of partners. So how can we test these different partnerships? And we might be testing something in Cambodia as well and I mean, it may women all over the world yeah. is in need of this product. So it's just figuring out the right distribution model that includes the right kind of education. Yeah. My first advice is do it and do it now. One of the main considerations that Maxi, Julia and I sat with uh, was before we started. If we wait, we, some of us is going to get a really cool job with a high salary. And, you know, it's going to be more difficult to uh, that we have this timing where we can commit ourselves. Yeah. So let's do it while we're used to being poor and eating pasta with ketchup anyways, yeah. because we've been student for so many years. Mm. Um, that's the first thing. So do it and do it now. And don't, you know, don't think that you should have everything sorted out, yeah. that you should have, you know, answered all the questions because people are constantly going to, but what about this? What about this? What about this? And you need to figure out things as you go along. But if you don't start, it's not going to happen. And my second, like, real advice is never hesitate to pick up the phone and call and ask somebody. 
not even like don't think that you're beyond the league. For example, last year we were trying to design a product. Mm. We thought Coloplast, they're, they're world leader in doing intimate healthcare products and working with this material. But we're students, you know, yeah. why would they want to work with us? And we're like, it can never harm to call them and ask. So we did that and they said yes. Oh, yeah. And that's my experience that when you ask, most people would actually really love to help you because yeah. um, they love passionate young people. So you're, you're very rarely going to get rejected. As long as you ask for advice and knowledge, people would, I mean, money is a different thing, but yeah. <laughs> advice and knowledge, people are going to help you. And that's the most valuable resource you can have. Yeah. So your team can be experienced and small, but the world and the network that you can create to help you is, yeah, indefinite. Yeah. So my last question to you is, what is your vision for the world? My vision for the world, as what I'm feeling right now living in Africa, is that we don't have this separation between first, second, third world, basically. And that we stop looking at poverty as economic poverty. Because in Kenya, there's so many people who don't have finances to send their children to school, mm. but they are so rich in so many other things. Yeah. And in Denmark, we have almost everything, but people are suffering from depression and all these other diseases that follow with I don't know, the fact that you don't have to struggle for a living. Yeah. <coughs> so I think we, if we start understanding what is a good life more holistically and don't get stuck in what you can measure, what mm -hmm. you can't measure, and share that, and uh, because then I wouldn't call Denmark the first world. Yeah. I don't think we're necessarily happier yeah. than you are in the third world. So if we'd have a different idea yeah. of how you measure a good life, you will also have a different idea of what makes you rich. And so with that perspective, starting and sharing knowledge of how we can all share a rich society. Yeah.